Hello everyone and welcome to part 4 of this series where I build a CPU in Factorio using belts. Today we're finally going to see a working CPU and I will be demonstrating a few programs that run on it. The entire circuit is going to be made up of elements that I've described in the previous parts of this series. So if you haven't seen those, I'd recommend watching the previous videos first so that you'll better understand what's going on. Now the only new component that I want to introduce this time is this. Unlike other components, this one doesn't have any computational function. Instead, its job is to deal with minor glitches in Factorial's belt system. Unfortunately, as of the current stable version, which is 0.16.51, sometimes random gaps will appear on fully loaded belts, or random signal items can get sideloaded onto what appears to be a fully loaded belt, causing glitches in our signal like this. You might have noticed this happening in some of the previous videos, especially in part 2 within the scrolling display. The glitches seem to get worse when you crank the game speed up, or when the game is running at less than 60 UPS. I think they're due to the way the game deals with compression of items on belts, but unfortunately I haven't found a way to prevent this. So that's what this first stage is designed to address. The idea here is to make a copy of the glitchy signal and merge the copy with the original so that individual gaps can get filled in by an extra item coming from the copy. That way we can get a full belt again even if our input has minor gaps. The second stage here addresses the opposite problem, which is when random individual items end up on a belt that should be empty. This can happen if for example a glitchy signal with gaps goes through an inverter. So the way we deal with this is by again making a copy of the signal, but the copy goes through a squiggly path up here, while the original takes the direct path. The two then meet up at this AND gate. The idea here is when you have individual glitchy items, then the two copies will not arrive at this gate at the same time, and so nothing gets sent to the output. That effectively filters out those individual items. But when you have a full belt of items coming in, then it doesn't matter if one copy arrives later than the other, and the result will still be a full belt. By using these two stages, we can basically clean up a signal to get rid of these types of glitches. Finally, because the belt here can be a mix of different item types, we can just use a third signal copier to convert everything into a uniform item type. And now let's look at the CPU. The CPU is composed of five main units, the clock, an instruction pointer and program counter, program storage and instruction decoder, general purpose registers, and the arithmetic logic unit. The ALU is basically the same as we saw last time, I've only made a couple of minor changes. On top here, the two sets of inputs are now connected to outputs from the registers. I've also added the circuit at the top, which detects if the top set of inputs is all zeros. This will be useful when we talk about the instruction set. At the bottom, the input signal for selecting the operation is now connected to the instruction decoder, and I've added lights here, which will change colors depending on the operation the ALU is currently performing. The output lines from the ALU are connected to the left here. Here, we have a set of multiplexers that will select between two sets of values depending on this signal coming from the instruction decoder. If this line is on, then the multiplexers will output the set of values coming from the left side, that is, the program. Otherwise, they will output the set of values coming from the right side, which is the ALU. The selected set of values are sent upward, and they go through signal copiers so that each register gets a copy of these values. Basically, this will allow us to control whether to load a register with a value specified in the program or with a value that's a result of an ALU operation. These blocks in the middle are the registers, which are entirely made of memory cells. Each one of these five sets is a register, and each register can hold a value of six binary digits. The line here on the left side controls which of the five registers will be loading the value coming from the multiplexers below. This is a multi-valued signal, where the item type can be one of these five chest types. Each test type corresponds to one of these registers, and I've placed lights here that will show which register is currently selected to load value. This signal is combined with a clock signal using an AND gate, 
and the result is connected to the enable input of the memory cells. Similarly, on the output side, these two signals will select which register's values will be sent to the ALU. These are again multivalue signals where we have the five chess types selecting their respective registers. These lights will indicate which registers are selected here. Next up, we have the program and instruction decoder. Each row here stores one instruction of our program, and the program can be up to 16 instructions long. The architecture here is basically the same as the one we had for the multiplication table from part 3. When a row gets activated by the input coming from the left here, all of these program values on the row will be sent down their columns. Each instruction is made up of 10 signals. The first one is the instruction opcode, which selects the operation that we want to perform. The next three are selections for registers that we want to output to the ALU and the register where we want to store the result. And the last six lines can be used to specify an arbitrary six digit binary number. Here are the formats for instructions that can be used with this CPU. First, the seven science types can be used as opcodes to perform the seven operations supported by the ALU. For these instructions, you need to specify source and destination registers as needed, but the six digit binary number is not used. For example, the add instruction will take the value stored in the two source registers that you specify and put their sum into the destination register that you specify. Aside from arithmetic operations, we also have a load instruction, and the opcode for this is a wooden chest. This instruction takes a destination register and a 6-bit value, and it will simply store the 6-bit value into the register. Finally, the last instruction is a jump if zero instruction, whose opcode is a train station. This one takes a source register and a 4-bit value, and it will cause the program to jump to the position specified by the 4-bit value but only if the source register currently holds a value of zero. With these instructions, it's also possible to do things that are not immediately obvious. For example, if you want to move the value from one register to another, there is no explicit move instruction, but you can still achieve the same effect by doing an AND of a value with itself. A value AND itself is still the same value, and if you store the result into a different register, that effectively copies the value over. Of course, you can also use the OR operation for this, or add a value to zero, or subtract zero from the value, or whatever. There are lots of different ways to do it. For the jump if zero instruction, you can omit the source register by not specifying anything here. That will turn this instruction into an unconditional jump, because a non-existent register automatically has a value of zero. Similarly, if you don't specify anything for the opcode, then the CPU won't do anything and you get an equivalent of an idle operation or no op. The instruction decoder works like this. First, the opcode signal goes through some filters to test if they are jump if zero or load instructions. If it's a jump if zero instruction, then it also goes through an AND gate with this signal, which is the one I talked about earlier from the ALU, which tests if a register has a value of zero. This output here will be on if the instruction is jump if zero, and the zero signal is on. This then goes over to the instruction pointer together with a copy of the four digit value for the destination of the jump to control whether the program should jump. The next instruction being tested here is the load operation. This is directly connected to the input to the multiplexers that controls what value gets loaded into registers together with the six bit value that needs to be loaded. The rest of the opcodes don't need to be filtered here. They are sent over directly to be used by the ALU. As for the three signals which are selections for source and destination registers, these are simply connected to the corresponding selection lines in our register file. Next up, we have the instruction pointer and program counter. The purpose of this unit is to control which line of the program gets executed. Up here, we have a counter which increments the value by 1 on each clock cycle, similar to the one I showed in part 2, and this is responsible for getting the program to execute in sequence one line at a time. For the jump if zero instruction though, again we use a set of multiplexers here, controlled by the signal coming from the instruction decoder. 
the multiplexers will select either the value from the counter or the value coming from our program, depending on whether the program should jump. The current instruction pointer is stored here in these four memory cells. Notice I am using the setup to remove glitches from these values here because the lines are critical to driving the entire program's execution. If we have any glitches in these lines, the program will also become glitchy, which leads to really bad results. This column here is a new way that I'm implementing the 4-bit binary decoder. Back in part 1 of this series, I used a much more complex setup to make a similar decoder for the 7-segment display. This time though, I've improved on the design by using multiplexers and a line with 16 possible item types. Working backwards from the output, the final output signal comes out of this multiplexer, which is controlled by the first bit of the instruction pointer. If this bit is a zero, then we'll output the value we received from the section above it. And if this bit is a one, then we'll output the value we received from the other section below it. Each of these sections now basically does the same thing again, but with the second bit of the instruction pointer. If the second bit is zero, then it'll output the value coming from these three multiplexers. Otherwise, it'll output the value coming from these three. The same logic applies to the remaining two bits as well. At the end of this chain, each multiplexer is fed with items that represent each particular bit pattern. And this is how we turn a 4-bit binary signal into a single signal with 16 possible item types. Now to decode this, we can just use a series of filters to test for each possible item type. I've placed lights here as well to indicate which line of the program is currently being executed. The final component to complete our CPU is the clock. This is just an oscillator with a sufficiently long cycle. I know back in part 2, I talked about how slow clock cycles are in those circuits. Well, in this circuit, our CPU needs almost 5 minutes per clock cycle. Now that we know how this CPU is constructed, let's run a few example programs. Here is the first program that I'll demonstrate, which calculates the Fibonacci series. Here is the program as it is coded on our CPU, and here it is translated into a more human-readable assembly language. The program starts by loading a value of 1 into two registers. These are the first two Fibonacci numbers. Then to calculate the next one, we have an add instruction to add those two, and store the result into a third register. To calculate the rest of the sequence, we move the second Fibonacci number into the first register. Move the third Fibonacci number, which we just calculated, into the second register. And jump back to the third line to add these two registers again to produce the fourth Fibonacci number. and it's going to keep repeating this cycle to produce more and more of the sequence. The second example I've prepared is a program to sort two numbers. After loading these two numbers into registers, the first thing we do is subtract the first from the second and test if the result is negative. If the result is positive, that means the second one is bigger and the numbers are already in order, so there's nothing else to do and we jump to the end. If the result is negative, that means the first one is bigger and so we do this sequence of moves to exchange the two values. This last jump is here because the CPU doesn't have a stop instruction. The way we get a program to stop executing is by having this instruction to jump back to itself. That way, the CPU will be stuck at this instruction indefinitely 
and will not execute any more of the program. The last example I'll demonstrate today is this program to multiply two numbers. The multiplication table I showed in the previous video was only good for multiplying one digit, whereas this program can potentially be used on numbers of any size. The algorithm here is basically the same as the method everyone learned in elementary school, but with binary numbers. You first look at the last digit here. If it's a zero, then you can move on. But if it's a one, then you add a copy of the top number to the result. Then you move on to the next digit and do the same thing. Except when you add, you need to shift the position over to line up with the digit. And you would repeat this until you run out of digits. And the final sum is the answer. That concludes this series of videos. Of course, this CPU is still missing a lot of features. First of all, there is no real input or output. Everything needs to be hard-coded into the CPU, and the only way to see the result is by peeking into the registers. There is also no external storage or memory, and no way to address memory. It doesn't support relative jumps or indirect jumps. And it certainly doesn't have more advanced features like interrupts. I will upload my save files and link to them in the description down below. Feel free to play with them and come up with your own designs. I love Factorio, and I love the community around this game, and I would absolutely love to see what all of you can do with it. As for me, we are actually expecting our first baby in the house any day now, and so I probably won't have much time to play video games for the next, I don't know, 10 years? Anyway, thank you all for watching, and thank you for all your support. I had a lot of fun and learned a lot of things making this series, and I hope you did too watching it. Bye!